Dr. Stefan Robinson, Dr. Is, Stefan Robinson is a nuclear and head of the section responsible for disarmament and water at Green Cross Switzerland. Since Green Cross Switzerland was founded, he's been a member and he's played a key part in the campaign for the destruction of around 80,000 tons of chemical weapons. Dr. Stefan Robinson, subject this afternoon, is get the results of the measurements carried out on radioactivity in Fukushima. Big hand, please, for Dr. Robinson. Hello, everybody. I know it's Saturday afternoon, and there's uh, the, a the lot of things that you could have been doing privately on Saturday afternoon, and yet you've got your sufficient interest in the subject to come along and spend two hours here listening to a complex issue for which I thank you very much. I would like to begin my presentation by speaking about nuclear materials, why they can be good, but they can also have negative impacts on health. And then I would like to tell you a bit about the measurements we carried out in Fukushima ourselves. And at the end, I'd like to present our conclusions to you from those measurements. So much by way of agenda then. But before I start on the subject, there's one person in this room who I'd like to present to you, a person who played a central role, Dr. Marina Kvostova. Marina, Dr. Marina Kvostova. Marina actually did the sampling and measurements for us in the Fukushima district. Dr. Kostova works for the Russian Academy of the Sciences in the Environmental Centre of that academy. She lives in Moscow. She has 16 years of experience as a radioecologist and carried out measurement campaigns to measure plutonium and isotope productions in Mayak. Mayak is probably the most radioactive place on Earth where, and in Sadovinsk, where nuclear ships and submarines are built. She's also carried out measurements in Angarsk at the Uranium Enrichment Centre and also on uh, Lake Baikal and a joint project was to the measurement, of, uh, the measurement in Bryansk on the Russian side of the border from Chernobyl where the forests are severely contaminated. Now, as you know, radioactivity is actually a natural phenomenon. It describes a form of uh, energy distribution, and you see that at the top, and you can imagine it as a wave or as particles being spread about. In physics, we distinguish between different types of radioactivity, um, alpha, and then we have a beta type, and then another type called gamma. No details, but you're familiar with that. It can be positive, but it can also be negative. You can use this radiation for medicine, but you can also cause nuclear damage and, in the worst of worst cases, death. We're not quite so familiar with um, neutrons. The older ones here will remember the neutron bomb, which was a big issue in the 1980s. These different, different types of radiation can have different influences on the human body, physical or chemical processes. What you see in the slide now is we have a molecule which is irradiated and the molecule changes and the molecule might perhaps be DNA in um, the human body or elsewhere and there will be a fracture caused. Radioactivity is natural. 
The biology has over millions of years learned to cope with radioactivity. We have repair mechanisms in our bodies, but they're not 100% either. And the repair mechanisms sometimes don't work completely. And that is where radiation damage can occur. It may lead to a disease or genetic damage, which is then passed on to another generation. Now, a distinction is made between two types of radiation. Professor Samet will be talking about this later on, actually three types of consequences which can be caused by nuclear radiation. First of all, acute damage. That occurs above a certain dose level, such as a nuclear bomb or radiation, massive radiation over a short period of time. The different sorts of health problems listed on the screen at present with increasing severity, the severest of all, of course, being death. Chronic lower doses is the second case. We're talking about something which doesn't become visible immediately. It's a long-term damage, possibly even only years after a small dose has been assimilated. According to today's knowledge, there is no threshold values. With acute dose, we say beyond a certain level, there is a cutoff. The lower doses may change DNA, may lead to cancer or uh, genetic abnormalities. We've had to consider, well, where are the critical limits? The important point here is that there is no value that is globally binding. But there are certain basic assumptions on which I'd say there's a broad measure agreement which we would say that's a sensible place to draw the line. Most countries would say the limit value for the general population would be an, a, one millisievert of nuclear radiation per year for the population at large. Some people would work professionally with radiation, people in medicine, people working in power stations, people working in research facilities, they're allowed to be subjected to up to 20 millisieverts per year. The difference is that these people are subject to medical monitoring. They will be examined once a year or more frequently. They carry dosimeters, which I evaluated, making it possible to see early on if there is perhaps a health issue and it necessarily need to look at them in greater detail. Acute damage is uh, set at a level of 500 to 1,000 times what we would say is the normal maximum radiation for the population at large. Now, on to Fukushima. You can see the radiation map on the screen at present. Here's a nuclear power station. Here's where there was the main burden, but there are different ridges which um, have spread out towards greater Tokyo. Now, if we want to know whether this radioactivity is harmful, we ought to understand which radioisotopes are present there. The point has been made that not all radionuclides are equally dangerous. Some uh, disappear in a few seconds. They decline quickly. Others are not relevant um, for the human body. If we assimilate them, we simply... Uh, el eliminate them uh, quickly as well. But there are certain key radionuclides that can become very much involved in the human body and its um, metabolism. You've probably heard of the two most important ones of these, cesium-137, which accumulates in the muscles and the organs generally, and secondly is strontium-90, which accumulates particularly in the bones. Those are the two radionuclides which are the health markers, um, the representatives of major threats to health, in other words. What you can see on the screen now is contamination around Fukushima. People living in the coloured areas would be subject to chronic radiation. As we said earlier on, of course, they won't fall ill immediately. It may take years for them to 
uh, be affected, and they be affected in different ways. Acute damage, as I said earlier on, are people who um, suffer tremendous exposure more or less instantly on the occasion of the accident. But what we see increasingly over time is the psychological burden, the stress, knowing you've been subject to radiation or knowing that you're going to have to live with unknown lasting effects. This has a big effect on people's feeling of well-being. With our research, with our measurements, we wanted to know well, what does the situation look like. So Marina was asked to use professional equipment to measure external radiation, what affects people from the outside, and also to measure samples in particular, soil samples. The soil samples were tested by a licensed laboratory force. The measurements are extremely complicated. It's not something that you can do quickly. Some of these measurements may take up to two weeks, and they require highly specialized equipment and knowledge. Now, we took samples within the no-go area in different locations. We had values which were the equivalent of um, 35 millisieverts per year, in other words, 35 times the level that is generally believed to be a cut off, below which you would have no health damage. Outside of the cut off, um, the Kato area, we, me we measured um, particularly in Kori Sauma and found up to uh, 26 millisieverts, including measurements made in a park where children play. We, we took, as I say, these samples in uh, this uh, municipality too. It's important to understand if we measure radioactive values, after the accident, the radiation was ejected and distributed. And when it comes to land, it isn't spread evenly. It's like a leopard skin, full of spots. There might be a problem on the left-hand side of the road, not on the right-hand side of the road. But we don't know, without technical resources, we are not able to feel or experience radioactivity. We are blind to where it's dangerous and where it isn't. That's why it's important to be able to have a sensible definition of where we assume there is likely to be a high risk, where we, we've got such a patchwork uh, situation, and there might be other areas where we can say the danger of uh, getting an additional extra dose is very low. It's never zero. You'll see when I show you the results later on, or perhaps you take a look at the slide and the left-hand side in particular, which is meant to illustrate how complicated the measurements are. If you measure, you will take a series of samples. After that, you carry out a second series um, an empty run, you might still have a small residue from earlier samples. However well you clean, there might be something left in. Then you separate the two spectra, um, subtract one from the other, and the final result tells you what actually really has happened. Um, I'm telling you simply here why it's so complicated. Now, this slide shows natural and artificial radio Nucleides. As I said, radioactivity is natural, it's always been there. But there are certain radioactive elements which nature never produced. And when we find them, we know, aha, that's uh, come from human beings. They're the ones shown at the bottom of the slide. We found in our samples rather large numbers of these artificial radionuclides, so it's a good indicator that they came from the 
uh, Fukushima disaster. Here you see the results of our measures. You can see, first of all, the name of the element, two samples, one and two, how they radiate, alpha, beta, gamma, and so on, what we measured, the number of decays per kilogram, and the decay product. As I told you earlier on, there isn't a worldwide agreement on the limit values. We took the Swiss limit values here, assuming that Switzerland has a, a sensible view of things, and then we look to see where do we exceed this value. Those are the points shown in red. The red values are above the Swiss limit values, the black ones are below. Then you have half-life shown on the right of the screen. Read. The half-life is the time it would take the material to become half as radioactive through decay. As a rule of thumb, we say we take 10 to 13 half-lives until the radioactive material is no longer a threat. So the two important ones here, the cesium and strontium that I referred to, they have about 30 years multiplied by 10 half-lives gives us a bit about 300 years. So if you've been in an area that's affected with strontium or with cesium, then for the next 200 to 300 years, that area is not really um, usable for normal economic activity and social activity. We know from Chernobyl, there are people living in Chernobyl, but no one is going to offer to invest millions in a new factory there. You can live there, but not for normal human life and economic activity. What is our conclusion from all of this? Several conclusions. As I said, radioactivity is very unevenly distributed. If you're going to have a no-go area, you're going to have to consider this question of lack of uniformity. Our measurements show that the high gamma values external radiation rates in public places, including in parks where children play, and children play on the ground and in the soil and with the soil. We have many long-lived nuclear uh, nucleids that we've de 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 detected in plants. That is true. Uh, that is no, no surprise. If you look at cesium and strontium, there is a biological half-life. They don't remain in the body uh, forever. They are gradually eliminated from the body. But with strontium, you can see that once it gets incorporated in our bones, it's there for life, really. We have various alpha radiators, which are particular, th particular threats to health. If they're simulated, we find high values for some of these alpha radiators, alpha emitters, sorry. And what we didn't consider, we only took soil samples. With Fukushima is on the um, edge of the sea, and a large amount of radiation were washed out to sea, and it can have, have a big impact on food. Japan is a country in which people eat uh, many... Um, a large amounts of fish and um, other products of the sea. So the migration of radionuclides into the environment and into food has to be understood. Green Cross is very actively involved in this area. For more than 20 years, we have been involved directly in Chernobyl, and much of what we learned in Chernobyl has, is now being applied in Fukushima. We have a training program for the local local population, for instance, as to um, how you can grow food products in such a way as to minimize radionuclides in food, or how you can cook things um, so that as far as possible, when you are kept out of what is actually finally served up. We've also got family clubs whom we support in um, encouraging to buy cleaner food or food with as low a level of contamination as possible. There's one final slide I'd like to show to you, and that's a question of the no-go area. Sorry, I start this again. Before it makes sense to do anything, 
There's no point in cleaning until you've got rid of the emission, stop the emission from the reactor. Um, you clean something up, and, it, and, and it, it, it's a Sisyphus uh, task, really, uh, because um, you then you simply have more contamination following. So that's why it's important to stop the contamination from escaping. The no-go areas defined by the Japanese are shown on the screen at present. And what we see there is that these are areas that were evacuated. People moved into neighboring areas, some of which were highly contaminated as well. The people who used to live here were paid compensation to enable them to go and settle somewhere else in Japan, to rent a flat somewhere else. We see two problems with this. There are plans that by 2018, the beginning of 2018, there will be no evacuation in the green and orange coloured areas again. That will be the end of compensation payments. So um, people will be forced to go back to these two areas, um, the green and orange coloured areas then, as I say, beginning of 2018. Another thing that we saw with our measurements was that outside of these areas, there were some high values measured, given the patchy nature that I referred to. In Switzerland, in particular Green Cross, we believe that the ending evacuation from the green and orange coloured zones is not a reasonable thing to do, and that particular compensation for families with children, children are the most vulnerable group in society in particular, that they should continue to re receive compensatory payments so that they can go and live in other parts of Japan. If that's not done, many people would be forced to stay there or to go back to these areas shown on the screen at present. If you can't sell your house, if you haven't got your money that you can use to buy a new house to set up a new livelihood somewhere else. That's all what I want to say about Green Cross, and I thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for patiently listening to me.